Polytechnic at USC. She holds a PhD in electrical engineering from the California Institute of Technology. And her research interests include biomedical microelectromechanical systems, or biomems, implantable biomedical micro devices, among many other topics. She is also the recipient of several awards, including the NSF Career Award, the 2009 TR35 Young Innovators Under 35 Award, and she's also an active educator. Um, so today she will tell us about thin film microfabricated medical implants. So welcome, uh, welcome again, Alice. All right. Well, thank you for inviting me uh, over here. It's it's nice to actually <laughs> leave campus and experience a different part uh, of USC. Um, and I guess when I was preparing for this, I, you know, I have to say that uh, this is a very different group than I normally present to. And so hopefully we'll have fun together and and um, um, maybe come up with some new ways in which to collaborate. And I think I've had some great discussions with some people here. Um, ISI has always been, I think, this fantastic resource that we have. And I think it's with, with LA traffic, sometimes it's hard to get down here and make connections. Uh, but hopefully we'll make some more of those uh, today. So um, I guess so business keeping it uh, away, I you know, have to disclose that I have interest in some startup companies. Um, most of the work will not relate to them, although some of them some of it at the end may relate to the effort we have at Sincere. Um, to, to give you an idea of kind of how I work, um, maybe I'll start from there. So I'm fundamentally trained as someone who builds devices using integrated circuit uh, manufacturing techniques. And uh, in my graduate training, I did a lot of work with this wonderful material called silicon and then um, also a little bit in glass. And what we're doing at that point in time is transitioning from making you know, circuits. I've actually never made a circuit in silicon, I think. Um, uh, and using those tools for their ability to make small structures and to put them together in interesting ways to make microelectromechanical uh, systems. Um, and by the time I joined the field in the 90s, the hot thing was actually how do we use these not to make accelerometers and pressure sensors for cars, a lot of work done in automotive um, and consumer electronics, but how do we take those tools and start to use them in, in the area of healthcare? And so as a graduate student in electrical engineering, I was not really doing any standard electrical engineering. Instead, I was uh, creating tiny little mechanical pumps and tiny uh, uh, mechanical valves and trying to in integrate them into, um, at the time, the, the goal was to build these credit card size systems that could essentially shrink an entire you know, analytical chemistry or molecular biology lab into a chip and perform all those very manual functions in that very, very small space. That was the vision at the time. Um, I think that... Uh, since then to now we've realized that you know, a little bit of that is still science fiction because there are some very uh, big challenges that still have to be solved. But some of those, some of those original goals have been uh, sort of made reality. Um, probably around the time that I was finishing up my PhD and, and going into a postdoc and thinking about faculty positions, I made a little bit of a pivot. And you know the, the whole area of being able to build these sort of labs on a chip, uh, very popular for doing diagnostics, um, but I kind of felt that was a bit of an uphill battle with diagnostics. You have to uh, you have to unseat the gold standards, and I think that's still the challenge today. Is there are very established gold standards, and so I didn't feel like I could make a big difference there. Um, so I switched a little bit and started to get into more medical applications, um, and so turned uh, my I, I would say you know training making microfluidic systems, and instead looked at things like medical monitoring and how do you, how do you um, introduce different uh, therapeutic modalities. And so, you know, everything else is sort of the same. We can control tiny features that are very, very small, put them together in interesting ways, combine different modalities and build systems that are, um, uh, I think, very powerful in a way. Um, frequently, all of the expertise doesn't sit in one place. And so all, each of us as researchers winds up working on a chunk of that. So just in general, if you're not familiar with this uh, type of technology, everything I do is very much a layer by layer process. We control layers that have, um, you know, down to nanometer type resolution, all the way up to layers that have, you know, uh, several tens of microns. Um, it gets to be a little bit more difficult using microfabrication technologies to do that, uh, to, to go above that limit. And so then we'll turn our, our attention to sort of uh, the best 
um, sort of larger scale micro machining type um, um, processes and 3D printing and stuff. We want it, if we want larger features, and so um, traditionally in in the world of MEMS, the one thing that sets it apart from making integrated circuits is that you don't just add material down; you also selectively remove that uh, from time to time, and so you're able to create uh, more interesting mechanical structures in that way. I do a little bit of that, but less so of the carving out large chunks of material, which was really, really needed to build microfluidic structures because you had to carve channels out or different wells. You needed to do that. But now I, I, I work mostly in thin layers where there's been like selective removal material in a very small area. And so I, I do a lot of what's called surface micromachining. So we'll put some materials down and we'll take some off selectively so that we can create the interesting structure that we want. If you look traditionally at the bottom, these are just some examples where MEMS devices, mostly silicon, are, are being used today. They're, you know, I think millions and millions and probably billions on the planet now. Um, and it's, it's still sort of growing. I think in automotive and consumer, it's probably going to plateau, and really a lot of people are looking towards sort of healthcare as, as sort of the next frontier. Um, the devices I make are uh, sort of intentionally simple compared to some of the other stuff that has been done, um, I think, by colleagues. I think I came to the realization that if you want to make devices that are going to be used down the road in a clinical setting, they have to be in some ways a little bit simple. If you make them too complex, there are just too many ways in which they can fail. So we try to simplify as much as possible. So this is a cross-sectional. We speak in my field in a lot of cross-sectional diagrams, which you kind of show shows some simple steps. We put down a layer of material. We use a lot of, uh, of a thin film polymer called perylene, and then we'll put down some metal features that provide some um, interesting functions, and then we'll sandwich that in another layer of perylene. And the, the perylene serves two purposes. It's actually support structure. It's also an insulating material. Um, and so um, both of those need to work out well for us in order for the devices to function. At the end of the day, you know, we discard the silicon substrate below. The reason we need it is it holds everything flat. Uh, and the flatness is key for us to make high fidelity uh, features at with micron uh, or below precision. Without that, it would be very, very difficult to transfer patterns into um, uh, into our devices. So we hold everything flat on the silicon, and then when we're done, we can literally peel it off. It turns out that the perylene doesn't stick very well to, to silicon, and so peeling it off is actually pretty easy. And on the right-hand side um, is just a picture of a, a device we made actually many years ago now, but that kind of gives you an idea of what one of these things might look like. The perylene itself is completely transparent. You'll see some metal traces in there, and then you'll see some things that are kind of reddish. The reddish features are basically falsely colored to show that there's like a feature there um, that you can't see too well because it's sort of below the resolution of that image. But they're little chambers that we use to do sensing. Um, in fact, I actually brought some devices with me to show you what they look like. Uh, it's sort of unfair to blow them up on a screen because they much, look much larger than they really are. They're actually quite small. Um, the typical thicknesses of the of the devices we make are on the order of about 20 microns or so. Um, so very thin, very floppy, uh, very soft. Most of what I do today, I forgot to mention earlier, is driven by collaboration. I don't do any animal work. I don't do any clinical work. I make devices. And so in order for my devices to find some use uh, down the road, what I try to do is I reach out to different people and find if they have unique challenges that can't be solved by any existing technology. And so if there's a match, we'll work together uh, and you know, work alongside them, um, implementing them in animal and so forth, and eventually in, in human. Yeah. This is a naive question, but what, why would shrinking it down make it feasible to do something that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do with larger? Yeah, so, so what I look for are uh, challenges uh, related to dimension, so scale. Um, I also look at challenges where they need to pack a certain level of functionality in a very, very tight space. Uh, and so if you're dealing, and I'll talk more about this actually as I move on in, into future slides. So if you're um, trying to deal with things at say cellular scale, it yeah. becomes very difficult to use conventional manufacturing to make um, features for different structures that can interface at that scale. So, so I'll, I will get into that. <clears throat> All right, so this is a sort of an overview of different areas that we work on. I'm not going to really talk too much about drug delivery. That's work we did um, some time ago. We're very active right now in um, it, different electrode interfaces to different nervous tissues, uh, nervous system tissues, partly because there's a big emphasis on that in terms of funding right now, and we also do a lot of work in sensing with, with clinicians. So I'll talk a little bit about two, two, um, two of the problems. So 
to get back to why small was good. So as part of the brain initiative, uh, one of the things that we want to be able to do is study the brain at a scale where it has not been possible before. Uh, and so I'll go over some of the technologies as to you know where where we've come from and where we'd like to be able to go. So um, I think most of you probably heard of this. I'm not going to go into to great detail, but if you break down what uh, different systems are in the brain, you can kind of see that it spans multiple um, length scales. Um, and then also, if you get down to the to um, what's going on molecularly, there's a great deal of complexity in how the different individual sort of computational units are connected, and also the means by which they communicate. So incredibly complex. I look at this as job security because these problems are not going to be solved in the 10-year time span of, of the Brain Initiative, at least for what it is right now. Right. So this gives you an idea of length scale. That so I'm going to work mostly at the level of the cells. If I want to get smaller than that, that's actually kind of difficult with the techniques that I have. And in fact, um, because all these cells are packed in, I've kind of plucked one out here. They're all right next to each other. If you uh, put a device in there, you're going to disrupt um, the natural system in some way. And so you want to be as minimally disruptive as possible. So if I'm trying to get out information, um, both at uh, large scales across multiple areas of the brain, and with high density, get as much information uh, out as I possibly can. This is what we currently have to work with. And so you can look, there are different levels of invasiveness. You can, you can attach electrodes to the outside of the scalp and actually get information. But the problem with that is you can um, essentially, if you draw an analogy, it's like you know, you're kind of sitting in a very loud room and you're listening from, or you're actually you're sort of sitting on the outside of a loud room with a bunch of people and they're all having conversations and you can't quite make out what's happening. You're just getting sort of this this um, combination of, of different conversations going on. And you, and you might be able to get snippets of what's, what's being said, but really you, you can't resolve it very well. And so when you sit on the outside right, of the brain with an electrode, that's kind of what you get. To get the highest resolution, what you have to do at sort of the cellular scale, you essentially have to stick an electrode uh, close to the neuron. Um, the best technique at the bench top is essentially to jab a, a, a specialized um, electrode and sort of bridge the inside of the cell with the in inside of this such a fluidic electrode and get at the um, different uh, signals that are being fired through action potentials. That is destructive. You can't do that at scale. You can do that one, maybe a couple of neurons at a time. So that is just not really uh, something that can be scaled in the way that we'd like to for the brain initiative. So instead, what the field has done is they stick electrodes close to neurons and record what's known as an extracellular action potential. And so you can kind of get an idea. There's some information there. It's not quite the same as intracellular if you look at the right hand side, but it's still um, better than if you're if you're listening much, much further away. Um, the finer you, uh, yeah. This has something about the challenges we're doing using you know. Yes. So if you want to do uh, research in animal, you have many, many, many choices. Um, there are folks doing recordings from things like worms, C. elegans, right? So you can look at uh, the nervous system all the way down to the sort of the most simplest um, uh, sort of, um, you know, invertebrates, right? Um, uh, you can even go down to, uh, well, just so there's, there's a range there. Then you look, and, and a lot of those don't require any sort of um, uh, animal use committee approval, right? So every university has an iCook. If, as you go into uh, vertebrate animals, then there's, there's a certain level of scrutiny that is required. You have to look at how you're going to do the experiments, how, you know, what precautions are you going to take to minimize stress and discomfort, um, uh, you know, all those kinds of details come into play, um, and so the you know there there are some hur uh, hurdles you have to go through, but those those things can be done. As you go from um, vertebrate animals into human, uh, now you have to deal with a different um, sort of regulatory body. There's an institutional review board that monitors all that kind of um, all the requests to be able to do experiments in humans using electrode-based devices. And there you have to demonstrate, you know, what, what are the risks? How are you going to mitigate them? Are the devices safe? Um, we're not even talking about efficacy. So for research, oftentimes you're trying to get to that point. So you're really, the bar that you're trying to, to um, overcome is essentially that safety. And so there's a lot of stuff that has to be done. Um, and 
I, I would say that the path is not necessarily clear in all areas because with each different discipline, uh, clinical specialty, there are probably different requirements, right? Um, uh, so that, that's kind of a, a general um, view. And then if you want to get into sort of clinical trial down the road where you're looking at efficacy, there's other other things. You, might, you probably have to get the FDA involved. Some Sometimes IRBs don't require FDA. Other times you have to get the FDA involved. So um, it gets more and more difficult um, as you go down the road. All right, so what would we like to do and why do we want to get at this information? So if you ask a neuroscientist, they may tell you one thing. And if you ask someone who's interested in treating a patient, they may tell you another. This set of information here is really what the neuroscientists want. They're very greedy, they want all the data possible, and they want uh, the very best data that is not degraded in any way over periods of time. Because they're, looking, they're interested in looking at how different parts of the brain communicate with one another, what, um, what different activities that occur at the millisecond scale, um, how do those impact um, you know, function versus what happens on length scale of, of years and years. And so they want a lot, and this is like, a, you know, a very difficult list to satisfy all at once, right? There are sort of a number of different channel ch challenges as far as dealing with um, addressing cellular scale, all right, interfaces versus looking at multiple regions, um, time scale, the longevity of a device, and how can it record um, with high fidelity for a long period of time. And also, um, I think one thing that gets left out is if a device is to be introduced surgically, it has to be compatible with some sort of workflow, whether it's done in um, you know, vertebrate animal or whether it's done in, in a clinical environment. Uh, and so that has to be thought of in addition to satisfying everything else. And, and typically the goal is you want to get as much information as you can while minimizing any damage. Um, so in terms of, you know, where we've come from, um, we have actually made quite a bit of progress and a lot of that is attributed to advances in silicon uh, micromanufacturing technology. Before, we would use very crude wires to interface with neurons. That can be done. It's been done all the way, uh, you know, back in the time of Galvani and so forth. Um, but we've, you know, and I think this plot actually doesn't capture all that really, really old stuff. But if you look at more recent history, there's kind of a Moore's Law analogy that as technology develops, um, we can double the number of, of neurons we can record from roughly every seven years. So this is if you're on the path of technology with silicon right now. Silicon is sort of at the leading forefront. Um, the challenge, though, is if you look at these more traditional materials, is that they're really quite hard and they're quite stiff, right? So this is the typical structure that they take. They look like tiny swords that are inserted into brain tissue, and they may have one or more electrodes along their length. Um, the, the sort of simplest one are metal microwires that are insulated everywhere except at the tip. Um, there's a silicon, uh, uh, analogous silicon version of that in the middle, where you have silicon tines with only one recording set at the tip. And then there's a, um, a more dense approach where you take the silicon and you make it um, more planar as opposed to um, more like a microwire, and you put electrodes using micro patterning and you put it all along the length. And that way you can record from a greater volume of the brain uh, that the, the probe interacts with. And on the, the back end of the probe, um, on the right-hand side, you'll see that there's some integrated circuitry, and there's there's actually some, um, I guess, like great power in being able to do that um, in a very small package. So these devices, I should say, so um, the one in the middle was developed at University of Utah. Uh, I think it was in the 80s or so, and so they basically have become known as Utah probes. The uh, ones on the right-hand side are developed by University of Michigan. They're called Michigan probes. Uh, and actually, all of these are available through commercial vendors that have yet another name. So you'll you'll hear all sorts of different language if you start to look into this of what these things are called. Um, that's sort of the, the the academic origins of this stuff. Um, regardless of which one of these you use, the challenge is they don't last for a very long time. So if you um, are trying to do recording, let's say in a rodent, which is a very common model that's used in neuroscience to be able to understand what is going on, um, you're lucky to get recordings consistently over weeks. You might get you might be able to get recordings over months, but getting getting it for many many months or on the order of years is really really hard, and that that sort of holds true as you go into um, larger and larger vertebrate animal species and up to up to non-human primate uh, and in human as well. I should mention that um, the Utah arrays in the middle are actually what are used there. They have um, uh, an IDE, investigational device exemption, to be used in human and clinical trials. Uh, and so a lot of the press you see around neural interfaces 
taken with the Utah or BlackRock is a company that markets it um, probe. Um, but the problem is all of them, they, they will lose uh, sites over time. In fact, I went to a talk just recently given by one of the guys that's running the clinical trials, and he said that in one patient, basically, they lost all of the different um, electrodes, and so there's no ability to record from the device that's implanted in the brain. And there were 100 to start with, so all of them are gone after uh, a bit of time. Um, so this is this is really one of the key issues that, that is facing the field. How do we get around um, the longevity issue? The, when you insert one of these devices, it forms a scar. Uh, it's from the natural body, uh, body's immune response. Uh, and what happens there is the neurons you want to record from, you need to be within about 100 to 150 micron, microns of the neuron, otherwise you can't record from them. So the scar forms, so that's this uh, picture in the uh, middle there on the bottom, um, and basically walls off the electrode and pushes the neurons away. There's, there may be some neurons that are sort of, that die off in the, in the, from the injury, but regardless, over time, uh, you lose the signals and, and you really don't want that to happen. And why is that? Part of it is, people think, because the materials are so much more stiffer than brain. So the bar in the middle, the line in the middle, the arrow, represents Young's modulus, which is a measure of the stiffness of the material. Um, and you can see on the bottom are sort of the mechanical values for Young's modulus for different uh, body tissues. Brain is super, super soft, as well as spinal cord. And materials like metal, you know, tungsten, silicon, are very, very stiff. With polymers, which are now very, very popular, you can actually improve the, the stiffness, reduce it by a factor of about 100, but you're still many of orders, uh, many orders of magnitude off. And so there's some evidence that suggests that moving to softer materials can help greatly, but it doesn't solve everything. It just, it's better. Yeah. So I must assume that this is a sort of scattering of the injection processes cause any like permanent brain damage? Yeah, so, Permanent brain damage. Um, I don't know that people have really quantified that. So in most cases, so so the the, the um, studies that I know of, where this is used, is often in, in sort of uh, people who are paralyzed, right? And so they essentially have no use of their their limbs in any way. Um, and the studies that they've participated in, they have a hundred uh, electrode array implanted in their brain. And the idea is they think about motions. And then that is decoded and sent to a robotic arm, and that robotic arm serves as, you know, their link with uh, the, the world, right? So they're able to interact with the world through this robotic arm. Um, so, you know, people have survived years and years with these implants. Um, if there is a, a lot of damage, I, I don't know what the risk-reward benefit process, you know, uh, thinking is that they go through, but um, it interfaces with their motor area, and I guess they can't use it, right? Because okay. every time they replace this, it goes to the they, My structure. understanding is that they don't. They don't go in and replace it. So once it's in, it's in. Um, they do scar over. It can be actually quite difficult to, to remove because uh, it's trapped in a lot of fibrous tissue. Um, and sort of, sort of anecdotal, anecdotally, I've heard that um, sometimes also there's like a depression left in the brain. I think this may be from non-human primate work when they, do, when they can go back in there and retrieve. Um, so there's probably some damage left, but then there's so much redundancy that it may not be a big deal. And I think a lot of these patients that participate probably sign waivers and such saying that they may receive no benefit. Right? So softer is better. That's the sort of message. Um, and so what we we're trying to do with the soft materials is that we don't have technologies yet uh, or demonstration that we can get to the level of sophistication of silicon. Um, the most advanced silicon probe today, I think they measure something uh, like a centimeter long. Um, and in that centimeter, they can pack some, something like a thousand electrodes. So it's a lot of electrodes in a little tiny space. And their other devices have different arrangements where they have multiple multiple tines, if you will, with, with um, uh, a lot of electrodes. And so we're not at that point with the polymer um, um, type uh, technologies. And so I've been trying to push um, the, the envelope here and develop polymers, floppy polymers that can be implanted in the brain and also increase the density and figure out how we're going to address this issue of if you want to get to thousands of electrodes, how are we going to get the signals out because we don't want to have this bulky thing sitting on top of, at least right now, an animal's head. This is also an issue for the, the silicon folks as well. Um, so in collaboration with others at USC, we developed a deep brain polymer probe array for addressing the hippocampus. The hippocampus is a structure that's involved in a memory formation. It has a very 
well studied circuit and that has different pieces and my neuroscience collaborators know that they that they're interested in looking at the signaling between these different regions and so they want to have uh, electrode structures that are anatomically matched to those regions of the brain so these are um, the sort of pastel colors are overlays taken from a rat brain atlas and we use those to design the layout of our electrodes so that sort of staggered arrangement is very, very intentional and is matched to the anatomy. Um, I'm not gonna go, I think, too much in the detail about, um, I think, the uh, uh, specifics there. Um, the, uh, so if you make a soft, flexible polymer probe, mechanically it is very, very floppy, uh, which makes a lot of sense. And so if you try to insert that, which you need to do into the brain, um, it tends to undergo this mechanical phenomenon of buckling, right? And so you don't want that to happen. The way around this uh, that has been conventionally used is you essentially laminate some stiffer material next to it or you overcoat it in some stiffer material that can be then dissolved away later on so you can get around this uh, loppiness issue and insert it in the brain without it buckling. So this increases the cross-sectional area by a lot. Uh, sometimes it can be many orders of magnitude. Uh, and so you don't want to do this because you negate the advantage of making something that's very small. So we know that smaller is better in terms of immune response. We want to keep uh, a low profile. So what we um, looked at is you know, just the mechanical buckling equation, looking at um, B mechanics, is that instead of playing with uh, expanding the cross-sectional area, the other thing that we can do is temporarily decrease the length, and we can essentially uh, boost the uh, stiffness enough so that we can implant in the brain. Uh, and the way we do this is actually, I'll just skip forward here, is we embed the back end of the probe in a biodegradable uh, polymer known as polyethylene glycol dissolves away in saline. And so what happens is you wind up with a device that looks like this. You can kind of see that, that, that hazy material. That's the polyethylene glycol. These probes have no electrodes, which is why they're completely transparent. And what you can do, I have a quick video, you can insert the probes completely bare into the brain and then dissolve away the block on the backhand side and then advance the rest of the way. And so the significance of this is now you can address deeper brain areas beyond the first millimeter or two, which is what most of the other devices have done in the past. It's easier to get to those regions um, and study deeper structures like the hippocampus. And, and, and there are, this is deep relative to uh, rodents for rats. Uh, ultimately, what we want to do <coughs> is actually make devices that are 40 millimeters long so that we can address deep structures in larger animals used in neuroscience. All right, so sorry, there's a little bit of blood there. This is a, a probe being implanted into rat brain. This does, in fact, work. And uh, once the probes are down, we can actually look to make sure that we're in the right place by looking at the signature um, sort of uh, spiking patterns that we see in hippocampal um, cells. These complex spikes are highlighted in the pastel colors. So you have essentially one burst of a certain amplitude and it's quickly followed by a train of bursts that successively decrease in amplitude. Those are called complex spikes. So you can record with them. I'll skip that one. Um, uh, we can do this chronically. Currently, we're at about 11 months, so that's pretty good. This is sort of rarely done in rodent. It's kind of hard to do these studies over long periods of time. So you're able to get a reasonable amount of longevity. Um, that's more data about, uh, about uh, some, this is a snapshot taken a little bit earlier. Um, and it's very important for us to look at immune response. The immune response here is very, very good. Um, typically what we look for, these are qualitative images if you're not look, used to looking at histology. This is very common in the field. You take these histological slices, thin slices of the brain at different depths, and you stain and you go in and you look and see where there are concentrations of different types of staining. So here on the left hand side we're looking at astrocytes that have um, their immune cells that have gravitated to the site of the probe. And there's very little of it. Um, if you're not used to looking at these, this is really pretty good. Usually you see this large area that's affected next to the probe. This is quite minimal. And then on the right-hand side, the little brown stain areas, those are neurons. And so you can see there's, a, there's still a lot of neurons next to where the probes were. Uh, it looks uh, fairly normal nearby and then out to about maybe 100 microns away from the probe. It actually goes back to normal if you do the analysis. So, so that's all good. Um, yep. So if immune response is such a big bugaboo for you, yes. like, can't you just fool the immune system somehow, code the surface? Yes. So there are people who are doing that. Um, the challenge is, I think, um, 
the people who are addressing the biological response are a different set of scientists than the ones who are looking at developing electrodes to do recording and a different set from the neuroscientists who are actually using that information. And you frequently see that here where, you know, you see people making essentially uh, probes that have no electrodes and they look at mitigating your immune response by putting coatings on, introducing different drugs, and they'll show something and then that's it. It doesn't go anywhere. And so there isn't really a, a, a merger of fields. We, in my lab, we've done a little bit of that work, but it, it you know, um, was sort of very um, primitive, and I think maybe compared to some of the people who actually developed these, these coatings and, and drug formulations. Um, in general, there isn't a lot of funding looking at these problems. Um, that's another issue. Funding agencies and reviewers are very short-sighted. They like saying, uh, I think, new technologies introduced for recording and <coughs> manipulation, but no one wants to fund issues like dealing with immune response, or the other big important thing is how do you deal with packaging? Uh, that's the other uh, big thing that, that you know, I'll talk a little bit about packaging. Um, uh, yeah. Quick main question. So in the previous slide, you showed that uh, you know you still sure guarantee that these neurons hear the probe are still alive. Uh, are they functional and active? Mm -hmm. Okay. That is a tricky question. And the reason that's a tricky question is we don't have a way of correlating using endpoint histology. Um, you have a probe and you have an electrode. I have recordings, but I don't know which neuron it is. So there are <laughs> some people who are developing techniques using uh, optical imaging where they put an, it, the window on, on, the, on, the, on the skull. But they have their electrodes implanted at this sort of odd angle so they can do imaging of that thin layer of the, of the brain. And they have some idea, but it's not perfect. And so we'd love to be able to do that. I don't have a good way of doing that just yet. Yeah. So in principle, it might be alive but broken. Yeah, and there, there are probably neurons that are there that, yeah, I mean, exactly. So um, there is work being done now to try to figure out uh, some of that, but it's still very, um, at a very sort of granular level, and it has not been translated into how do you deal with that in terms of recordings and devices, et cetera. Yeah. Okay, so the device I showed earlier has 64 electrodes in it, and we have um, a conventional connector that we have to put on the back end of our probe to interface with the recording system that my collaborators have. It's a maxed out at 64 channels. For others in the field who have expanded their devices to hundreds of channels, or even just 100 like on the bottom, um, they're essentially attaching one wire, one sort of macro wire, um, to each electrode on their device. And so you wind up with wire bundles. So the, the one on the bottom is actually a very similar device <coughs> to, to one that would be put in human. There's a large pedestal that sits on the skull that you have to plug uh, into. And then there's this uh, big, thick wire bundle that's actually quite rigid that then leads to the electrode array. And that gets all put in. And that wire bundle, that's 100 wires. If you want to scale, you can imagine that that diameter will expand and expand and expand and become completely um, just uh, ridiculous at some point, right? You, you can't do that. Uh, and then on the on the top, those are just simple microwires connected to the stack of, of uh, connectors. Those are sort of some of the densest connectors we can get in this in this field. Um, the Michigan folks, because they had access at Michigan to a facility that did CMOS microfabrication, they could put CMOS on one end, of, on the back end of their device. And in fact, it's integrated directly in the probes. And by doing so, they have a very small wire coming out because they can have multiplexing. Uh, and that approach has been taken not, not just by Michigan Group, but by many others. And by doing so, they can actually start to get larger and larger channel counts. Uh, and in fact, the, one of the most ad advanced um, devices that's made available commercially today um, is using some CMOS electronics in it, right? So if you're making devices out of polymer, you don't have luxury of having the silicon there. You have to bring the silicon to your polymer device, and so that's what we're trying to do. And in order to do that, we have to develop methods to package the chip uh, within, within our uh, um, ribbon cables on the back end. I don't want to solve another problem, which is packaging from the perspective that the circuit needs to be protected from the saline environment of the body. That's a really, really hard problem and hard to do at a very small scale. And I don't have a lot of space to work with if I'm doing a lot of experiment in rodents. So my idea is 
let's just get the chip there. We'll stick it on the outside of the body. We won't worry about uh, water intrusion just yet. And then we'll worry about that problem down the stream when we get everything else to work. So that's, that's sort of the approach we're taking. Um, in general, what we plan to do um, is take our old devices, which had eight electrodes per shank, and we want to uh, multiply that by a factor of eight and have 64. And to do so, we're going to put 32 electrodes on the front, 32 electrodes on the back. And so each linear array of eight will have 512 electrodes. And if we stack these, we can start to get thousands. That's the, the, the sort of idea. And we've made, um, the progress is that we've made our first batch of devices that have um, 512 electrodes because <coughs> our collaborator currently only has a system with 64 channels that we can record from. On the back end, we have only wired up a few of the electrodes because we can't address all of them. Um, we've made devices that will go into hippocampus and also into the, the surface, the cortex, so much more sh uh, shallow. Um, we've developed some te techniques to be able to do direct integration of um, silicon chips into our uh, ribbon cables. And I have just recently, a student showed that we can program in a single channel stimulator chip that has been integrated into our devices. Um, I don't have that data here yet. We're still working on some, there's not much to show other than, yes, we can get a biphasic pulse out of it. <laughs> so, yep. So at the beginning, I thought you wanted to take well, I don't want the silicon in. I don't want the silicon at the interface between the device and the neuron. I want that to be soft, right? But, but I still need the silicon so that I can do multiplexing, so I don't have a huge wire bundle at the end. But I mean, more important will be. Will, I mean, do you think it would be even possible to just take the silicon away from? It? Okay. Chemistry? That's a good. Yeah. So, so there are people who are working on organic transistors and so forth, the performance is not there yet and the sophistication is not there yet. And so when that technology catches up, great, I'll use it. But for now, it's a lot easier for me to just, I can work with others who make these chips. I can buy, that chip happens to be from a company called Intan. I can buy it bare die and actually integrate it. So I don't have to do too much and I don't have to wait for the long development cycle. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. So there, there, there's some simple circuits you can make um, right now. I'm not sure that anyone has actually demonstrated any sort of functional um, system that can do amplification for the recording and the multiplexing or even apply stimulus pulses using those, those circuits yet. Uh, that's still in development. Okay. So I'm going to switch gears. It's kind of abrupt. Um, um, but so the other stuff is sort of a work in progress, and we have brain initiative grant uh, for that work. The other area that we, work, we do a lot in is um, sensing. And so the specific application here happens to be a disease called hydrocephalus. Um, so I got um, involved in this actually after talking to a bunch of different uh, clinical groups at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. In fact, I was trying to talk to them about working on drug uh, infusion, and they didn't want to talk about that. They said, well, I have this other problem we want you to work on. And so, um, you know, we started uh, some, some work in this area. So the, the, the general, the, the problem is this. Uh, in, the, in the brain, uh, there is a natural balance between the production of cerebral spinal fluid, which has a number of different functions. Um, it is formed in the inside of the brain, the, in, the, in the ventricles, and there, it follows through this interesting flow pattern and gets reabsorbed by, by the body. And so you can maintain this balance between production and absorption, and it also, you know, also serves as a cushion of the brain. It's absolutely essential. In some people, um, the plumbing system somehow is damaged. We don't know exactly where that um, um, sort of malfunction is, and this is still a, a sort of a subject for investigation. Um, and, and so what happens is that the ventricles, which are shown in the bottom uh, uh, left, um, where the fluid is produced, they can kind of swell since the brain tissue is essentially compressible and it's sitting in this very rigid skull cavity. And so when that happens, naturally all sorts of bad things, um, um, bad, bad side effects occur. Um, on the bottom are some MRI images showing a normal brain versus a hydrocephalic brain. And in young kids where their skull plates aren't completely fused together, you wind up having very enlarged heads. Uh, and so one of the early um, uh, signals to you know, clinicians that something might be wrong is they measure head circumference and can figure it out. 
So this is treatable. Um, the treatment was first devised in the 50s and 60s and really hasn't changed all that much since then. Uh, surgeons will go in, they'll implant a piece of tubing, a piece of plumbing. One part goes into the ventricles in the brain, the other part attaches uh, through a valve that controls flow so that it flows essentially one way. You don't want fluid backflowing into the brain and, and drains it elsewhere in the body, typically in the sort of abdominal cavity. Uh, and these devices work quite well for a period of time. The problem occurs when they fail, and they fail very frequently. The predominant mode of failure happens to be um, at the point of entry for the cerebral spinal fluid uh, within the ventricles. So th these shunts tend to clog. It's just a, a you know, these shunts have at the um, tip uh, an array of holes or about, you know, um, less than a millimeter in diameter, not very big, so they're usually on the order of about 200 microns or so. They get clogged up with, with t tissue, debris, et cetera. And so this is very frustrating because uh, when that happens, you can't tell. A patient will come in, they say, oh, you know, I feel like I have a headache, I feel that I'm nauseous. That could be anything. Uh, and then to make matters worse, if you try to drill down um, and use sort of uh, imaging techniques, those are also very, um, uh, they don't, they lack enough resolution to be able to get at the problem. And so patients will suffer for some period of time. Every single headache uh, is a bit of a concern because it could be that they're sick. It could be that they have uh, a problem with their shunt and they have to go in. So these are some images of shunts that have been removed from patients. You can kind of see the uh, clogging is, is pretty aggressive. Uh, and so the only way to really tell that a problem has happened is actually to do uh, an invasive procedure. And that is um, usually done um, after the patient has suffered for, for quite some time. So um, this problem has been around for decades. It has not been solved despite many efforts. No one exactly knows how to control the clogging. And so I think the best we can do now is essentially tell doctors that is in fact occurring and that they need to go in and intervene. So give an early warning system. Uh, this idea is not new. It was proposed in the 80s, but the problem was back then the sensor technology just wasn't sophisticated enough to be used in a wet environment. They're all developed to be used in dry environments. Uh, and so they don't survive in wet environments. If you try to adapt them so that they do, you tend to uh, basically compromise their, their performance in some way when you add protective layers. The other thing is that by adding protective layers, you dramatically increase size, and that's a bit of a problem as well because we're not dealing with a lot of real estate. And so there are a number of reasons why we don't have sensor eye shots. So we're going after, um, in my group, a, a system of very, um, a uh, very small miniaturized system where we can have multiple sensors in a shunt that are essentially attached in line that can inform a clinician that something is wrong and they need to intervene. Um, this is the state of the art right now in terms of the medical pressure sensor. These are approved for use in Europe uh, only, I believe. I haven't checked to see if these have come to the US yet. But this is a telemetric um, pressure sensor. I have a zoomed in image there. You can kind of see it's a silicon pressure sensor. You can see the individual wires coming off of that. Um, and it leads from um, that tip to a puck that essentially has wireless um, circuitry in there and allows signals to be sent to an external box that a patient has to carry around. Um, and so they, they you essentially have to carry it around in a little backpack. They have, uh, in Europe, children that have been implanted with these and they're very, very cumbersome because you have to haul this uh, unit around. They've miniaturized the box since then, but this is still only a single sensor. It's not on the shunt. It's used somewhere else in the brain that um, uh, the patient ha um, is able to use. But this information is only pressure, and unfortunately, pressure is not enough uh, by itself to be able to pick up that, in fact, the shunt is malfunctioning. Um, in conventional pressure sensors, uh, the way they typically work is that there's some element in the mechanically sensitive element that responds when there's a pressure difference. So you have essentially some sort of reference cavity that you form in your device. Typically it's held at vacuum and then on the exterior uh, of that system you have this very flexible membrane that then will deflect with, in response to pressure. You can measure this using piezo-resistive techniques or with capacitive techniques, both are fine. Um, requires a movable element. If you put this type of structure in the body, um, typically you have to overcoat that uh, membrane with some protective material uh, to protect it from the saline. Uh, and so that tends to really um, affect the performance 
And then overall, when you put these materials in the body and you have, uh, over time, uh, saline exposure, there are all sorts of bad things that can happen to the sensor itself. It doesn't really matter what kind of sensor you put in the body. The bottom is a flow sensor. You, you have all sorts of issues that you have to deal with. So these are conventional silicon-based uh, uh, methods. So um, several years ago, when we were working on um, actually a completely different project, we had the idea that silicon, pressure, uh, silicon sensors are just too big. Um, they're too rigid, and we should just get get around. We should just get rid of this idea that we're going to modify existing sensors and put them in the body. So let's start over and let's develop a method that involves using the fact that it is wet in the body, and we'll use that actually to complete the circuit for the sensor. And so we turn to this method where we have a pair of electrodes sitting in the electrolyte. Electro electrolyte represents the body, and that will t form this circuit. Um, this is uh, the well-known Randall's circuit model of electrode-electrolyte interfaces. Um, and then between them, there's sort of the solution resistance. So this is a mess. I don't want to use this for sensing. So what I'm going to do is simplify my life by looking only at high frequencies. If I look only at high frequencies, I reduce, I can basically bypass a double layer capacitance and everything uh, drops down to just the solution resistance. That's much, much uh, simpler to deal with. And then um, how can I use just the solution resistance to then uh, perform sensing? There are a number of ways in which I can build uh, my system up in interesting arrangements so that uh, I can essentially create changes in the uh, solution resistance and extract out parameters of interest. So this is very abstract. I'm going to give you something more concrete in just a second. So um, having this, there are a number of advantages. Um, I think I'm probably getting short on time, so I'll go through this quickly. Um, actually, I'll skip that part and just talk about sensing. So for shunts, we felt we didn't have a lot of data. In fact, there's not a lot of data in the field at all. This is a data impoverished area, which is why I think we haven't been able to make any progress on better shunts. Uh, and we, we looked at this and said, well, what do we want to know? We know that there already are pressure sensors out there, but pressure sensing is not enough. Uh, it's been shown that it, it cannot uh, by itself detect uh, problems. Uh, and so <coughs> can we directly look at whether or not a catheter is clogged up? Uh, and can we also double check and see if there is any flow? And using this combination of different uh, pieces of information determine what is absolutely needed for a medical device down the road. We may not need all of this. So we're sort of kind of throwing the kitchen, kitchen sink here. So we've developed all these sensors, um, uh, and I'll, I'll just walk you through this really quick. For patency, what we mean by that is really we're looking at obstruction. Obstruction can occur in one of two ways. You can either have ingrowth into the lumen of the catheter, the cross-section down below, or you can have growth that covers up the pores. So regardless of which one of these modes um, happens, our method will basically look at either one of them. Uh, yep? Is growth due to like scarring or is it due to say a child's brain cell? Yeah. Normally cerebrospinal fluid is pristine. There's not much cellular material in there. If you have hydrocephalus, all sorts of strange things can happen. In some cases, people who develop it, it's a result of trauma. And so you can have blood, um, you can actually have sometimes contact of the shunt with um, the brain. Uh, depending on how it's implanted, it moves over time. And so these patients have compromised uh, you know, brain, cerebral spinal fluid. And so there is protein debris in there. There could be cellular debris. So it sounds like this also means they probably have a low... No, they can live, um, they can live well. The problem is, um, is that they have to live next to a major medical center because only certain people are willing to, to handle this and know how to handle this. Um, and so they, um, you know, it, and the other, so the other thing is that if they don't catch, catch this early enough, there are different sort of cognitive deficits, um, different deficits related to um, uh, movement and so forth that can occur. And so they may not live high quality lives because of some of the issues, right, that, that uh, around the use of shots. Um, okay, so uh, if, if, so the, this um, sensor here is based on a very well-known um, Coulter counter principle where if you make a tiny little port, a uh, tiny little orifice and a material, typically they're counting cells or some other um, biological species, slips through that, you can actually detect the crossing. <coughs> uh, but here what we're doing is instead just looking at the fact that there's blockage, you wind up altering the volume conductive path between the two electrodes and you essentially wind up with a rise in impedance when you have blockage. And so 
Uh, I'm not going to go through the data. This, this does, in fact, work. We've modeled this at the bench top. Um, we've developed sensors that uh, look at flow. We use um, uh, an interesting principle where we, we, don't, we don't follow the convention, which is to use a, a resistive material to pick up flow. When you inject heat, the, the, resistance, the resistor uh, responds uh, to the presence of that heat through its uh, thermal coefficient of resistivity, and you can pick up flow in that manner. It turns out that it's actually much better to throw away the resistive material and to use the solution itself because the solution itself actually has a much more sensitive response to the increase in temperature. Uh, it's actually an order of magnitude higher than metal. And so we actually use the cerebral spinal fluid within the circuit instead of using a material like platinum, and we get uh, a great improvement. We can look at both temperature using this method, since it is fundamentally a temperature sensing technique, or we can use that also to look at flow as a packet of heated fluid, slightly heated fluid, um, runs across our sensor. Uh, another benefit of using this is that if you're using one of these metallic materials because they're not as sensitive, you typically have to heat the solution up a lot more. And you don't want to uh, add a lot of heat into the body. You don't want to cook the cerebral spinal fluid. So here we only need to raise the temperature by a degree or two to get um, the information we want, which is about an order of magnitude better than with metallic sensors where you typically have to raise temperature by about 10 degrees. Let's get through that. Last one is in pressure sensing. Um, so it's been known for a very long time that a micro bubble can be used to pick up pressure instantaneously, has actually a very good frequency response. Uh, mechanical engineers have used this uh, technique for decades. They seed a flow with a bunch of bubbles and they'll track it using video cameras. Uh, very, very tedious. We didn't want to do that. Uh, instead, we, what we want to do is we want to measure pressure in a certain location. And to do that, we have to find a way to localize the bubble um, and hold it in some way so that we can actually measure its size. Right? So those are the challenges. And to do this, we created a tiny uh, channel in which we can generate a bubble. And the bubble is exposed to the external fluid through two ports at the end of the channel. And the bubble will respond instantaneously to changes in pressure and then change its size. And we can measure that by looking at the electrochemical impedance. So here, as pressure increases, the bubble size gets smaller and therefore the impedance will drop. Right, so that's the general idea. And so we've done this. This, this works, although there are some um, issues now that we're trying to resolve as far as resolution. We are not at the resolution that we want to have yet. Um, skip that. And then um, what we've done recently is we've actually packaged all these sensors into a thin film. And I have some of these devices if you want to look at them. Put them all together and uh, put them in this tiny little lure lock adapter. And the purpose of that is in collaboration with a, uh, um, at then she was a medical school resident. Um, uh, came up with this idea that we could actually use these devices externally in human to get an idea of whether or not these sensors would work in a realistic uh, flow environment. And so we have adapted our sensors to work in what's known as an external ventricular drain. That's the device shown in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, and so our path uh, to, to get these into the clinic down the road is we're going to do that first. It turns out that's easier to do than to get these devices in into rodents, which are super tiny and have very little cerebral spinal fluid. Um, then we'll do some in vivo animal <laughs> testing, and then we'll do clinical validation. In fact, um, the current state we're at, I should swap that picture out. We've, did, we've tried to do this in rat. There is so little fluid that it is just too hard, and so we're going to use a larger animal model. We're looking at either um, uh, pigs or sheep right now. Okay, so this is what an external ventricular uh, drain looks like to me when I first saw one of these. It looked like a high school science project. These are very crude, but very, very expensive. <laughs> I think they, they're, you know, like thousands of dollars for this set of tubing and this ruler. Um, so in, in trauma patients, if you have head trauma, one of the things that happens is your intracranial pressure rises dramatically. And so one of the first lines of defense is you go in, they'll drill a hole in your skull, they'll put an external ventricular drain, and the purpose is to basically drop that pressure down to a safe level. And so these are put in patients up to about two weeks. Uh, and so there is um, some similarity between the way this works and a hydrocephalus shunt works. And so this serves as a um, sort of good model, uh, intermediate model, before we get into hydrocephalus shunts, which would require that we have completely implantable sensors with wireless uh, or wired uh, 
um, connection to the sensors, which is a lot harder to do and takes more time. So we developed these modules, uh, and we have uh, an IRB with Children's Hospital of Los Angeles to put these in. Um, and in the laboratory environment, we use a whole bunch of electronics to be able to do our measurements. We could not take that into the clinic. Um, with these trauma patients, you have no idea when they come in. It could be in the middle of the night. Uh, we have no warning. And we needed to give something to the hospital they could just have on hand when they need it. And so we developed, we, we basically miniaturized what we needed of the electronics, put that into a tiny little box, and that box then will connect to uh, our sensor. The box has a battery in it. It has a data logger. We retrieve, when we get the, the devices back, we'll take the data and, and analyze that. So... Um, uh, we just have uh, a little bit of data uh, on one of our sensors right now. The flow sensors seem to work, um, so we're happy about that. We're still going through analyzing the data, so I don't have it here, but uh, to kind of stay within time, um, I'm going to end it here and then basically take any questions uh, you may have if you haven't asked them already. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. Uh, for which one? For... Well, like the implantable. Yes. Yeah, okay. So power is, so you, you have uh, basically a few choices, right? So if you have an app device, either you have to have an implantable battery or you go with a rechargeable battery or you go with wires. <laughs> Those are the options. No one likes any of them. The implantable batteries, if you go that route, they're huge, right? And they're heavy. And so... Um, in current clinical devices, patients will have to go in and get like their pacemaker replaced, you know, if, if they have one of these sort of old-fashioned, there's some systems that are rechargeable now, but they'll have to get them replaced every, every few years. And, and you know, that's, that's sort of where we're stuck. Um, rechargeable batteries will require that you develop a lot of circuitry. It can be done. Um, but it can be um, a bit of a pain. And then we're thinking also that it, down the road, if you want to get FDA approval, they may want you to have another backup battery anyway, in which case it'll be even bigger, mm -hmm. right? So it's not really clear um, what the best solution for, I mean, you know, so most people just stick with the, the, the implantable battery that you have to replace every once in a while. With wires, um, anytime you have wires that cross the skin, there is potential for infection, right? And so that is okay potentially for an acute you know testing app, uh, testing scenario but down the road for something chronic it's just probably not a viable option um, ways in which that's been solved um, so if you look at say cochlear implants right uh, they actually have a wireless link but my understanding is the batteries on the outside of that implant and so they're able to basically drive whatever they need on the inside via this connection they have uh, with a battery on the outside, so it's sort of this active passive link that they, they have across the skin. Um, pacemakers, I already mentioned, they have to have a battery on the inside, right? A lot of the stimulators so are that way. So you can use like wireless charging? Yeah. Uh, you can a little bit. Um, I, you know, I haven't tracked to see which devices on the market are using uh, wireless charging. I know the technology exists, and I think people essentially have to weigh risk-reward benefit of going that route. So. So this is not a technical question, it's more like, uh, you, you mentioned at the beginning of collaboration, so it's like... Yeah, yeah. So, so my, my group is highly collaborative. Like I said, we, we have technology, but the technology is useless unless we find someone who actually needs it. Um, and a lot of what I've done is I've gone around to sort of um, clinical folks, right? Uh, but I would I would say that one area that uh, and we, I have some engineering collaborators as well, people who build integrated circuit chips, et cetera. Um, as we uh, I think progress, especially in brain initiative, one of the and, and some of the other areas, right? We're going to be generating all sorts of data, and and so we do in my lab very sort of simple analyses, usually one sensor at a time. Um, but I think the future really in in healthcare is taking data from multiple sources, whether it's sensors or other things, and then how do we integrate that and determine things like uh, well-being, right, state of health. Um, you know, Emilio, we just wrote like a proposal dealing with human performance, right, so that's kind of, and I think many groups are interested in that. And so I think that there is room for uh, large interdisciplinary collaborations, especially with people who understand uh, how to deal with the vast amounts of data and make sense of it. Um, uh, you know, 
you hear a lot about, especially in neuroscience, people are beginning to use techniques in machine learning, right? But I think most of what people in that community do is probably very, very primitive uh, and, and probably could be improved. And I think the issue really is getting people together to talk um, and, and figure out, you know, intellectually, what are the, the, the cool pieces that everyone wants to, to think about and contribute to? So I saw a lot of effort. Mechanical, right? Mm -hmm. um, but when you look at all of our senses, except for, well, all of our senses are transduced through some middleman. Yep. So, except for pain. So, is there any work with uh, that you're aware of that is interfacing with the transductive uh, sensor organelles, or just not organelles? At that resolution, so the the elements of the cells that are responsive. Um, not the not the element of the cell, but um, a interfacing with. Vibration is uh -huh. picked up through uh, many different types of cells. Is there a interface with those transducer cells? Hmm, okay, so um, there probably are people doing that. I'm I'm not as familiar with that. Uh, if you're if you're thinking about you know sensation of touch, that's a that's a big deal in um, I would say brain machine interface right now because you can uh, restore movement, but then what about tactile sensation, right? Um, but still done, I think, mostly at the uh, uh, neural level, right? So it's, it's always talking directly to axon. Right, for the most part. Um, I think maybe it's because of the subset of patients that these people are, are, are working with that frequently amputee, right? So there, a lot of those um, sensors are not there anymore, right? They, uh, but the, the rest of that circuitry is present, so you, you interface upstream. So personally, do you, candidly, um, do you think that speaking directly to neurons is <coughs> the common, like the perfect brain machine? The axons? So uh, what I think is that there are a range of different technologies that will be needed to address different disease states. Um, using electrodes, I'll talk about, there are many ways to talk to neurons. Using electrodes, right, to talk to neurons is going to still be a big part of, I think, uh, medicine. So I didn't get into, so the, there's another, so I talked mostly about the brain, but there's another whole area of bioelectronic medicine or they don't want to interface with the brain. They actually want to interface with nerves that innervate organs. Uh, so they want to get much more downstream and deal with things far more locally, right? And that is a huge area, a lot of investment uh, in that area uh, from industry. Not necessarily as much from academia, but industry has taken a big uh, interest in it because they're seeing that the drug development uh, pipeline is just, it's taking forever. Uh, and that, you know, so many candidates are narrowed down to so few, and even then there are major flops, right? And so they're thinking about, is there another way of actually um, getting at, right, uh, treatments through electronics as opposed to just pharmaceuticals? And so I think that's driving uh, a lot of interest. In fact, big pharma companies, uh, GlaxoSmithKline was one of the earliest players there uh, and invested in that. They have a joint effort, Galvani, uh, by electronics with Google. Mm -hmm. That's a, just a crazy question, just uh, inspired by the question that asked about power and just what you're doing. I mean, the body itself generates a fair amount of power. Yeah, right. Is anyone looking into using that as a source of power for? A lot of people have. Um, we, so we used to. So there used to be this um, engineering research center uh, at, at USC that was focused on neural prosthetics, and we had industrial. Uh, members. And I remember someone from <laughs> TI saying, yeah, they had looked at everything. They'd even looked at putting uh, uh, little, uh, you know, turbines in the nose and using <laughs> inspiration and, you know, for, for uh, generating 
you know, power or, or harvesting power. There are all sorts of, of people looking at that. I think that the challenge is that with, is if you're looking at powering like a, a neural interface, most of the commercial devices out there are stimulators. Oh, I, I just looked at recording, right? So for therapy, it's stimulation. And for stimulation, those are power hungry devices in the end. And the types of, and the, the uh, amount of power you generate right now um, using these sort of alternative methods just don't have the performance uh, required to be able to drive devices yet. And that, that there's a big mismatch there. So I think this brings back to my you know, original question earlier on whether you know you would need more transition really out of uh, you know electric circuitry biochemistry, right? So because that doesn't require any amount of power. Why why don't why why there is not you say there is not that Progress or or uh, there, there's a, a lot of people are working on power generation, alternative methods, and whether it's harvesting from the body or you know using glucose right, <laughs> and converting that into something. Uh, the, ch the challenge is that uh, the amounts of power they're able to generate and the needs of, say, medical devices today, it, they're just too far off. Right? So um, there, there are no practical solutions other than batteries if you want, like, you know, to implement a medical device today. It, it just doesn't exist. Um, you know, there, you could look at, there are um, alternative methods where you use RF induction to, to, to power passive implants. You can do that and, and decrease your uh, profile, right? The, the, the mass and the volume of your, of your device that's implanted. Uh, there are those tricks, but it's not, it's still not, you know, body power generation. This is science fiction, science fiction probably a stupid question, but uh, I mean, our body generates, you know, the, the, the barn snort of calories per day, right? And a right. bunch of that is in the brain. Yep. So the brain seems like a naturally a container of you know, energy. Energy. Right, so why can't we harvest? It's the <laughs> No, I, that, I say it's science fiction, but I mean, yeah, it seems yeah. like uh, yeah, we generate a great deal of heat up here, right? Now. I, I, don't, I think probably because so a lot of a lot of you know, what I've seen or been exposed to is just using motion, right? Using motion, but not so much using I guess the sort of metabolic throughput uh, to drive the brain. Um, I guess you have to figure out a way that it would have a path forward and be acceptable, <laughs> right? Uh, so I, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Maybe you have an idea. Is it scientific? Is it scientifically possible? Um, you'd have to ask the power generation folks. I haven't done any calculations to know, you know, if that's even within the realm of possibility. Yeah. Right. I just thank the speaker once again. If you want to see devices, I have some, so I just pull them out. The nice things I can. No, I mean, it's different. Oh, I've seen these on the benches of your labs. Yeah. Okay. You probably saw it last mm -hmm. time. Just like, so these are the implanted brain cells. So this was the. This would be like the 500 something. No. So it's very very similar in layout. This is a 64 mm -hmm. one. The the 500 one. Um, well, I don't have a, a display box for one yet. So oh, well, at the same time, the only difference would be like the number of electrodes. The width is still the same. It's about the same. Because yeah. it's so it's designed to address hippocampus. And yeah. So you only got a certain span and a certain length that you can make them. Does this sit those, are, those are just wires. No, the <laughs> wiring. These, the, you know, the mm -hmm. physical circuit, the, the, the circuit that, the the, that sits on the skull. It sits or? on the skull. Okay. So, you mean outside? On, yeah, so outside that picture in the upper right, that's this, typically oh, okay. um, how it works. This one, that one's got some other hardware on it I too. Thought it was this is a, a different experiment. <laughs> uh, so there's a mound. We use a, um, the, the typical thing is they use a lot of dental cement. It turns out dental cement is really good for embedding this, and usually you just leave a little tiny bit out. The, the rodents are very clever, and they can rub against and knock it off. You, you frequently get, mm -hmm. it's very frustrating, you get a lot of failures because the animal will knock off your. Your, your connector, and then you, you're done. Even if the device is in there, work, you can't get to them. So, but if they, I mean, how how uh, 
just just a small side. If they knock it off, do they give themselves brain damage or damage themselves? Like how? No, they're usually they're ha so so rodents. I mean, so rats are used a lot in research because mm -hmm. they are very resilient. Yeah. Um, what I heard recently is, in some cases, you don't even have to give them antibiotics because they're so used to living in filthy environments that they can recover from anything. Right. That's pretty cool. They're very robust. So the only the polymer is the part that goes into yeah, the Yeah, actually wet, only the only the tip. The, like, the rest the... of it is just um some, to give us some space to, to mount it on the head. Mm, wow. Right. Um yeah, and oh, this one is for actually most of this is just packaging, but that central area we see some dark uh, a nerve will lie mm -hmm. along that and we it's a cuff, so we wrap it. Um another <laughs> Yeah, this is all just packaging for, for mm -hmm. attaching wires on the outside. This is in the chip integrations. Just shows you.